name is Brian Birch. Uh, I work in the Office of Academic Affairs here and I'm a longtime professor of religious studies and philosophy here and have the pleasure of working with uh, Boyd Peterson and Dennis Potter and David Knowlton and, and some other luminaries uh, in Mormon studies. And uh, it's just been a delight to work with them over the years to, to build this program and to bring us uh, to, uh, to events like this where we can have a, as good a dialogue as we had earlier today. Uh, as you know, this uh, lecture is in memory of our beloved colleague and friend, Eugene England, who is the founder of the Mormon Studies program here at Utah Valley University. Uh, Gene came over from BYU uh, uh, passionate and invigorated to try to uh, begin uh, productive, scholarly, meaningful dialogue uh, across uh, Mormon studies lines. And uh, it's due to his uh, energy and his tirelessness that uh, we are able to gather here in honor of him. And uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, try to continue on his legacy uh, and, and try to maintain the spirit that he tried to uh, begin and enliven here at the university. Uh, before I introduce uh, Patrick Mason, uh, there are people who need our attention and thanks, and uh, the most notable of, of whom is Boyd Peterson. Boyd, please raise your hand. Boyd is the organizing force behind this conference, and uh, he serves as the program coordinator for Mormon Studies here, and uh, is a, cl a close friend and colleague and collaborator and co-schemer with me and others. And uh, it, it's, it's one of the highlights of my uh, professional life here at UVU to be able to work with Boyd. As you know, there are many others who deserve our thanks and, and attention, and uh, notable among, among those is uh, Blair Van Dyke, who uh, hosted us at the Institute of Religion for the reception. I'd like to thank uh, him and his colleagues and students uh, for their efforts here. We've had a very good working relationship with the Institute. Uh, we try hard to maintain our integrity as a state institution, but we believe that good faith partnerships uh, with the Institute and other uh, organizations uh, just make our efforts all the more uh, invigorated and productive and uh, ecumenical. So many thanks to Blair. Uh, others have been involved in well as well and we want to thank them uh, for their efforts. Uh, our lecture this evening uh, is a very fitting uh, presentation in light of what Eugene England was about. Because if there's one word that describes what Eugene England was passionate about, that was peace. And as you know from the program, that's the topic of, of tonight's lecture uh, from a person who is passionate about these issues and is uh, highly specialized and uh, just brings uh, a wealth of uh, experience and savvy to this topic. Uh, so Patrick Mason is the Howard W. Hunter Chair for Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University, and he is also an associate professor of North American religion there. And uh, I have the, uh, the pleasure of being connected to Patrick in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that uh, our families go way back. Though Patrick is uh, 10 years younger than me, as you can tell from my uh, graying beard, uh, our families uh, uh, were in the same ward together uh, in uh, Taylorsville, and uh, P uh, Patrick was always the toddler in diapers running around the streets while I was the 10-year-old uh, uh, menace of the neighborhood. Uh, so it's been fun and exciting for me to watch Patrick, Patrick's rise and to uh, watch his work and to admire him uh, since we parted as young children. Uh, we're also connected in the sense that he now uh, teaches and heads the program at my alma mater, Claremont Graduate University, uh, which I had the pleasure of attending along with Dan Wotherspoon and other uh, LDS students uh, long before there was a Mormon Studies program there. And so Dan and myself and others are very proud 
with what's been happening there, uh, with what Richard and Claudia Bushman began, and now with what Patrick is doing uh, there. The, the program couldn't be in better hands, and I'm just thrilled to have him uh, carrying that banner for us. Uh, Patrick received his Bachelor of Arts from Brigham Young University in History. He has two master's degrees, one in history from the University of Notre Dame and another in international peace studies from the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace Studies there at Notre Dame. He received his PhD at Notre Dame also and after uh, a stint at American University in Cairo, uh, returned to, uh, to do work and to, uh, to do research at the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame before he began his post at Claremont. Uh, he's the author of the uh, recent book entitled The Mormon Menace, Violence and Anti-Mormonism in the Postbellum South, and that was published in 2011 from Oxford University Press. It's, it's an impressive work and, and one that I would recommend highly to you. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Mason. Thanks, Brian. I think that's the first time I've been introduced where people have mentioned me in diapers. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, but thanks. Uh, I'm really honored and, and humbled to be here tonight delivering this Eugene England Memorial Lecture. Uh, I understand that, that Charlotte couldn't be here tonight, but, but I want to acknowledge any other family and friends of Gene who've gathered here to honor his legacy, and, and I hope that my remarks um, help to do so as well. I have the great misfortune, uh, uh, Brian mentioned my age, I've, I have the great misfortune of being too young to have gotten to know uh, Eugene England. Um, I, I only personally encountered him once, it was in London in the summer of 1998. He was directing a study abroad program there and, and I was there as a student of a study abroad, of a different study abroad program. And on a Sunday night in the Hyde Park Chapel, he organized a fireside uh, for black members of the church to share their experiences uh, and their frustrations with lingering racism in the church. I was really deeply touched by the, by the spirit of that evening in which he allowed and gave space for these members to acknowledge their pain, but they also asserted that in spite of all else, they felt the church was where God wanted them to be. I was really impressed with the way that Gene facilitated the dialogue and, and inspired by his courage to speak truth and to acknowledge past wrongs in the context of a gospel of love and repentance. Uh, we all know that we still haven't sorted out all the issues that Gene spent his life writing and teaching about. Recent weeks have made that painfully evident. But I, I love him, I love Gene, for all of his work he did in making the church a more compassionate, more Christian, more welcoming place. Since that night in London, I've gotten to know Gene vicariously through some of his writings. His essay, Why the Church is as True as the Gospel, which I mentioned earlier today, became a, a kind of informal manifesto for a small group of LDS graduate students I was part of at Notre Dame. Uh, and my remarks tonight are largely inspired by another uh, collection of writings by his, a book uh, that he published in 1995 called Making Peace. And if for no, if for no other reason, I appreciate uh, having the invitation to give this lecture because it gave me an excuse to go back and revisit this old friend. Tonight I'll speak as an insider. My method will be exegetical, theological, and ethical more than historical. This is a departure for me because my primary training, as Brian mentioned, is as a historian. And in my scholarship, public lectures, teaching, and work with the media, I typically address Mormonism in the third person, in the mode of a detached scholarly observer. Tonight, however, because I'll, making an, I'll be making an argument from within the tradition that's primarily, primarily addressed to adherents of the tradition, I'm comfortable shedding the mantle of a detached observer and adopting the language of a partisan, of someone who has a horse in the race and cares about the outcome, because I think the outcome has real significance and actual consequence. My, my basic thesis tonight is very simple and seemingly uncontroversial. Peace is in every way better than violence, and thus, every effort should be made to achieve it in the, full, in the pursuit of full human flourishing. This statement seems obvious. After all, who's against peace? Perhaps no one would explicitly denounce peace, but many would qualify their support by saying that in a world where evil exists, where it's inevitable that some people will in fact choose the path of violence, 
the most appropriate and effective response to that violence in the service of securing the peace and protecting innocence is counterviolence, whether in the form of police action, self-defense, or even preemptive war. Most people don't like to think of themselves as sponsors of or advocates for violence. After all, that's what our enemies do. We are peaceful. They are violent. We keep to ourselves. They are aggressors. We respect human life and dignity. They respect only power and will stop at nothing to acquire it. Given that they recognize nothing but force and cannot be persuaded from their use of violence, it's incumbent upon us to protect our families, our neighbors, and our nation from their naked aggression and the intent to subvert our freedoms. <coughs> our use of violent force is, reg is regrettable but necessary as a means to the end of peace. Because evil persists, so does our need for violence. It's the only way. I reject this logic. I believe that Jesus rejected this logic. And if Jesus rejected this logic, then I believe that Mormonism and Mormons should too. Given our history of accommodation to the nation state since 1890, and our near universal acceptance of American militarism since the Spanish-American War, I think it's fair to say that modern American Mormons, with a few exceptions, embrace peace as an ideal, but not as a pragmatic ethic. I don't come with any authority or intention to dictate policy for the church. I simply want to briefly sketch out how I believe that Mormonism leads to a theology and ethic in which peace is not only the end, but also the means. By no means do I want to suggest that contemporary Mormons or the LDS Church are unconcerned with peace. On the contrary, peace is a common element of Mormon discourse on every level. But what do Mormons mean when they use the word peace? My own impressionistic sense is that when Latter-day Saints conceptualize peace, they do so in one of three ways. The first is personal, inner peace, achieved when an individual obeys the commandments and fosters a vibrant and faithful relationship with God and the Church. The second type is peace with others, emphasizing harmonious and loving relationships with one's family, friends, fellow church members, neighbors, and other associates. The third type is eschatological peace, referring to the future second coming and an ensuing millennial reign of Christ when, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. All three of these definitions are valid and important, but they leave out what I believe is an essential fourth category, structural or positive peace. This includes not only the cessation of direct or physical violence, hitting, shooting, bombing, and so forth, which peace scholars call negative peace. It also includes the understanding that true peace cannot exist in the absence of justice. Thus, for structural or positive peace to be attained, the structures of violence that brutalize humans or blunt their opportunities to, devel to develop their full capacities must be transformed as well. These forms of structural violence include economic exploitation, political repression, gender discrimination, racism, colonialism, and so forth. Individual acts of direct violence are usually embedded in the structures and cultures of violence. To try to eliminate direct violence while ignoring structural and, cul and cultural violence is like cutting a raspberry bush at the stem while leaving the roots. The plant will continue to send up shoots in unexpected places. I think it's essential for a Mormon theology and ethic of peace to take positive peace seriously, but my focus tonight, uh, because of limited time, will be on the less demanding and less comprehensive task of rethinking our relationship to direct violence, militarism, and the nation state. My comments will have strong implications for a discussion of positive peace, but we'll have to save that for another time. One of the things I love about Eugene England's book, Making Peace, is that it incorporates all the aspects of peace, from the personal to the structural. But he insists that we include the structural. He recognized that the ethic taught and demonstrated by Jesus compels us toward the political. As he observed, the Prince of Peace had to do with peace between nations. Declaring oneself a Christian and proclaiming allegiance to Christ's kingdom, England asserted, means discovering what the cost of discipleship to such a prince might be, even if it takes us into the rather impolite realm of politics. We needn't be held captive by a partisan Washington, D.C. definition of politics, but can th instead think more along the lines of Aristotle's affairs of the city, 
In other words, the issues that arise as humans come together in society and decide how they're going to be governed and to govern. With England, I contend that the politics of Jesus, in the words of theologian John Howard Yoder, forces, not, forces to have not merely an eye on what is good for the individual, and thus what makes the individual good, but also to keep our attention on what is good for the many, or ideally, the whole, and correspondingly, what makes the many, or the whole, good. Jesus is not simply a sweet savior who stands aloof from the political, social, and economic concerns of this world. The Jesus we encounter in the New Testament and who is further revealed in all scripture demands a total restructuring of society. What Jesus meant by telling Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world was not just that his kingdom is a kinder, gentler version of Caesar's dominion. As John Howard Yoder wrote, Jesus refused to concede that those in power represent an ideal, a logically proper or even an empirically acceptable definition of what it means to be political. He did not say, you can have your politics and I shall do something else more important. He said, your definition of polis, of the social, of the wholeness of being human socially, is perverted. This insight shouldn't be foreign to Mormon ears. As a powerful notion of community, of right relations among God's people, of a commitment to the building up of Zion on the earth, has been central to the Mormon DNA since Joseph Smith's earliest revelations. The full message of Jesus cannot be contained in a privatized, differentiated theology in which, in which religion is relegated to something done only in church and one's closet. Religion not only can but must take into account the political. This does not mean baptizing our secular political ideologies in religious warrants, especially equating the kingdom of this world with the kingdom of Christ. When that is the case, religion ceases to be prophetic and becomes culturally captive. The politics of Jesus are always in relationship with the politics of this world. The relationship, however, is never one of outright endorsement, but rather a prophetic witness aimed at reordering human society so as to more fully approach Zion. So what are the politics of Jesus, especially from a distinctive Mormon lens? How do we construct a Mormon theology and ethic that follows the politics of the Prince of Peace? Tonight, I'll only be suggestive, not exhaustive, by offering reflections in three areas. The war in heaven and the nature of God's power, the Book of Mormon and the question of just war, and the doctrine and covenants and the saints' relationship to the nation state. I'll then close with a few examples of Mormon peace building from the 20th century to show that a theology and ethic of peace is not only potential in Mormonism's future, but also deeply embedded in its past. The Mormon salvation narrative begins with war, namely the war in heaven. Of course, the term war is only a metaphor, as it wasn't a war in the martial sense, but rather a deep conflict between two unreconciled visions of human freedom and a contest for cosmic sovereignty. One could argue that the Mormon notion of the war in heaven is the original instance of sacred violence, that God or Jehovah and Michael and their lieutenants acting the, under a God's authority and direction forcibly expelled Satan and his followers from heaven after they rebelled. Our traditional narratives of the war in heaven offer a less than gentle portrayal of God, and by extension, his right-hand man, Jesus. He jealously clutches power and can brook no challenge to his authority. He is mercilessly punitive, casting a third of his children to outer darkness for all eternity. He uses coercive force to maintain his power and status against any rivals. In this light, the plan of salvation was brought about and guaranteed through the exercise of raw power, even violence. The ramifications of this view are significant. If violence was a legitimate, even godly means of fulfilling the divine plan in heaven, then surely it's a legitimate, even godly method here on earth. And authorized agents of God's kingdom may resort to violence to establish and maintain the rule of righteousness, especially when dealing with unrepentant and recalcitrant opponents. Is there another way to think about the war in heaven, one that, contributes to, one that contributes to rather than hinders a Mormon theology and ethic of peace? No doubt, much of the language we have of Satan's banishment is forceful. In the Pearl of Great Price, God tells Moses that by the power of mine only begotten, uh, I cause that he, Satan, should be cast down. There are other examples. But the notion that Satan and his angels, a third of God's children, were coercively driven from the heavenly courts against their will, 
goes against the very principle that Jesus and his followers struggled to protect against Satan, who sought to destroy the agency of man. Given the scanty information we have about the nature of God's pre-mortal judgment, perhaps we can rely on the scripture's more elaborate accounts of post-mortal judgment to draw some instructive parallels. Certainly the scriptures are full of characterizations of a coercive post-mortal judgment in which God seems to assign humans their eternal lots with little or no input from the accused. But select scriptures from the restoration portray post-mortal judgment in less arbitrary terms. In the Book of Mormon, Alma teaches that as men and women stand before God, they are their own judges. Joseph Smith's marvelous Olive Branch Revelation, section 88, is even more explicit. Referring to those who inherit celestial glory, it teaches, they shall return again to their own place to enjoy that which they are willing to receive because they were not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. The revelation states, for he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. And then adds a metaphysical rationale for what appears not as judgment by divine decree, but rather judgment as personal affinity. For intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence, wisdom receiveth wisdom, truth embraceth truth, virtue loveth virtue, light cleaveth unto light, mercy hath compassion on mercy and claimeth her own, justice con continueth its course and claimeth its own, judgment goeth before the face of him who sitteth upon the throne and governeth and executeth all things. Strikingly, God does not appear here as the agent of judgment. Instead, individual moral actors determine which glory or kingdom they can abide. The nature of God's judgment, whether pre or post-mortal, is only the proximate issue here. What is really at stake is the nature of God's power. Again, we're faced with multiple scriptural references to God as a man of war or God smiting the nations and other violent imagery. Yet given that the fullest revelation of God is in the person of Jesus, and that Jesus achieved the ultimate triumph over death and hell not via force of arms, but rather through selfless submission. We can conclude that language attempting to describe God's power as coercive, let alone violent, is at best incomplete, and probably represents flawed human conceptions of power more than the actual divine character. Consider this definition of the nature of divine power from Joseph Smith's letter from Liberty Jail, canonized as Doctrine and Covenants 121. The powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. When we undertake to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves. The spirit of the Lord is grieved. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness and by love unfeigned. The God revealed through Jesus and to, and to Joseph Smith exercises power through persuasion, not compulsion, compassion, not coercion, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and love unfeigned, not violence. God no more forced Satan out of heaven than he forces any of us in. Violence against the agency of uncreated intelligence, whether in their premortal, mortal, or postmortal state, is contrary to his nature. I don't know whether God can be coercive. I am only arguing that he is not. God's power of persuasion and love is the only truly efficacious power in a cosmos of independent and eternal intelligences. Because we are not mere creatures, the nature of his power and our relationship to him must be based fundamentally on volition, not violence. If this world is an apprenticeship for godhood, as Mormon theology uniquely posits, then the power we wield in relation to one another should be modeled on God's power of love, not Satan's power of violence. One might cede this theological point while maintaining that it re represents an ideal to be re realized in heaven, rather than a practical ethic of behavior in a sinful, violent world. This was precisely the argument formulated by Augustine of Hippo in City of God, which provided the foundation for the Christian just war doctrine. When Augustine wrote his classic work, he was trying to, prov to provide a theological and philosophical foundation for reordering Christians' relationship to state power in the wake of Constantine's endorsement of Christianity as the state religion. The pacifist ethic of Jesus that had guided Christians for nearly 400 years simply would no longer do. 
Augustine brilliantly and fatefully argued the one had to distinguish the violent actions that soldiers perform in the conduct of a war or military campaign from the spiritual constitution and disposition of their souls. Thus, killing someone was not unchristian so long as you had love for the person you killed. This was the genesis of a Christian just war tradition, which has dominated Christian ethics of war and peace ever since. While Jesus' teachings about nonviolence have become radical and suspicious, hidden and largely unheeded. Of course, of course, most Mormons haven't read Augustine and don't rely on him for their largely subconscious acceptance of just war thinking. In part, this is because Augustine's ideas have been accepted as common sense in the culture and thus require no explanation or examination of origins. But it's also because Mormons have the Book of Mormon. For all its potency as a witness of the divinity of Jesus and as a, as a clear explicator of basic doctrine, the Book of Mormon is also an exceptionally violent book from start to finish. The challenge posed by the Book of Mormon to a Mormon theology of peace is that it's not just the bad guys doing the killing, it's Nephi and Gideon and the sons of Helaman and the book's very namesake. While ruling out aggressive offensive warfare is illegitimate, the Book of Mormon does seem to accept the idea that violence is occasionally an acceptable, even necessary, though perhaps unfortunate, course of action in a fallen world. The Zion Society of Fourth Nephi is clearly the ideal, but that's pretty much where it remains. In the real world, it seems, violence is a fact of life, even for the saints. I would agree with this reading up to a point. The Book of Mormon clearly does depict violence as a fact of life, even for the saints. It clearly suggests that violence is sometimes necessary, even justified, particularly in defense of family and faith. But I don't think the book requires us to confuse its descriptions for its prescriptions. In other words, the way things are versus the way things ought to be. The Book of Mormon presents human violence as a tragic reality, but with an emphasis on the tragic. The ultimate message of the book is that there is a better path for God's people to follow, specifically, as Moroni wrote, that in the gift of his son hath God prepared a more excellent way. Read with this theological proposition in mind, with Jesus as our primary lens on history and theology, the Book of Mormon can be considered a carefully crafted tragic narrative highlighting the utter futility of violence, including a final rejection of violence as somehow sacred, salvific, or righteous. In order to read the text this way, however, we have to grapple with the life and writings of the book's major narrator and namesake, Mormon. On the face of it, Mormon, who spent most of his life as general of the Nephite armies, is the paradigmatic warrior saint. His dual identity as a general and a prophet seems to demonstrate that violence, as Augustine would agree, can be an appropriate path for even the most dedicated of Christ's disciples. Mormon's identity as a warrior is not incidental. It's not a job he got stuck with because of a bad economy. Rather, it's an identity he fully embraced. He named his son after a military leader from nearly 500 years previous, and then made that same military hero the central protagonist in the longest stretch of narrative in his edited compilation of the plates. Although Mormon vacillates on whether to lead his people to war against the Lamanites, it's not because he rejects war in principle, but rather because his people have become so wicked that he refuses to be their leader, period. The narrative he constructs reveals his general acceptance of violence, trained as a soldier, committed to the soldier's craft, and with a clear penchant for military history. Mormon is naturally inclined to honor the use of violence in defense of faith, flag, and family. He recognizes that it leads to blood and carnage. He's often meticulous about body counts. But his narrative suggests that the righteous always have enemies intent on their destruction, and thus self-defense of violence is necessary if regrettable. But is that really the underlying message of the book? Again, this is where we must separate Mormon's historical descriptions from his prophetic prescriptions. In the text, I think we can see him wrestling with a common sense notion of just warfare against a prophetic, radically nonviolent reading of the Christian gospel that he knew intimately from editing the records of Christ's visit to the Nephites. Mormon's portrayal of Captain Moroni, clearly one of his personal heroes, demonstrates this ambivalence. On the one hand, he provides a rapturous endorsement of Moroni's character, saying that if all men were like Moroni, the very powers of hell would be shaken, and the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. As a scrupulous historian, however, Mormon's depiction of the captain's temperament and behavior 
revealed that he was indeed somewhat vulnerable to the fiery darts of the adversary. Grant Hardy's summary is astute. He says, Moroni is stubborn and hot-tempered. He is never depicted as praying for assistance or relying solely upon God. And justified though it may be, he ends up with a lot of blood on his hands. Indeed, as Hardy notes, the picture Mormon paints of Moroni is as a professional soldier, not a religious exemplar. As such, he constitutes a notable exception among the list of the Book of Mormon's major heroes. Mormon gives us multiple narratives of good, often godly people who engage in violence because they feel they have to. But there are counter narratives as well, which undermine the received wisdom that violence is efficacious. Before his extended history of the Nephite wars with the Lamanites at the end of Alma, Mormon includes an account of Alma's mission to the Zoramites. The didactic historian, ever attentive to the reader learning the appropriate lesson, begins his narrative by stating that Alma thought it expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God, rather than military action against the Zoramites, because such an approach had more powerful effect on the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. This moral frame only reinforces the historical precedent offered a few chapters earlier, when the anti-Nephi-Lehi's consciously chose not to use violence in clear self-defense against the murderous Lamanite invaders. A thousand five innocent people were slaughtered that day. But to Mormon, who was keenly attentive to military strategy and consequences, this was in fact a great victory rather than a loss, especially according to a more expansive, heavenly moral calculus. The radically nonviolent Christian witness of the anti Nephi Lehi's had both a pragmatic and spiritual payoff. The invading Lamanites were so touched by this act of selfless courage, perhaps the most heroic act in all the Book of Mormon, that they threw down their weapons of war and they would not take them again, for they were stung for the murders which they had committed. The people of God were joined that day by more than the number who had been slain, and those who had been slain were righteous people, therefore, we have no reason to doubt but that they were saved. Nothing in Mormon's presentation of all the Nephites' many military exploits remotely compares to his depiction of the spiritual power of this singular narrative. Mormon's explicitly prescriptive writings make plain that the path of Christian discipleship is the path of peace. Most significant here are the books of 3rd and 4th Nephi, which collectively contrast the wicked and violent society of the years preceding the advent of Christ in the New World with the righteous, Christian, egalitarian, and pacifist society established in the wake of his coming. The message is unequivocal. A profound encounter with Christ leads not only to individual conversion, but also to a reordering of society based on an individual and collective ethic of peace and justice. <clears throat> that we have traditionally looked to the book of Alma rather than the Sermon at the Temple and 4th Nephi for the Book of Mormon's teachings on war and peace is as misguided as turning to Joshua and Judges while ignoring the Gospels. Frankly, I think it's a symptom of reading scripture through the lens of culture, rather than judging culture through the prophetic lens of scripture, and especially the life and teachings of Jesus. Mormon seems to have come to this realization at the end of his life. In his poignant final message to the Lamanites in Mormon chapter 7, there's one central theme, convert to Christ. Most of the chapter is spiritual and doctrinal, there is only one ethical prescription that the dying prophet attached to the gospel of Christ. Know ye, he prophesied, that ye must lay down your weapons of war, and delight no more in the shedding of blood, and take them not again, save it be that God shall command you. As Mormon considered what it meant to be a Christian, his final exhortation did not cite the just war tradition of his own hero, Captain Moroni nor did he point to his own life as a prophet warrior as the Christian ideal. Rather, he invoked the radical pacifism of the people of Ammon, who laid down their arms and refused to take them up again. In the final analysis, the Book of Mormon's teachings of the Christian gospel leaves those who would rely on violence, even when apparently justified, with more explaining to do than those who completely, re completely reject violence as an acceptable means of following Jesus. As we move from ancient to modern scripture, we find similar dynamics, though now the use of violence, especially on a large scale, is inseparably connected with the nation state. The Doctrine and Covenants provides the foundations for a, Mormon modern, for, for a modern Mormon political theology oriented towards Zion. I've explored this at length in a forthcoming article in the Journal of Mormon History, but so here I'll just give a brief sketch. 
The Book of Mormon accepted, Joseph Smith started receiving revelations with political implications within a few months of the founding of the church. One of these revelations, received in March 1831, helped flesh out the political implications of Zion. A primary characteristic of the end times, as revealed in this largely apocalyptic text, Doctrine and Covenants 45, is the violence of the nations, wars in foreign lands and wars in your own lands. But God's people were not to participate in this worldly violence. The revelation commanded the elders of the church to gather ye out from the eastern lands to Zion, the new Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. Zion was envisioned not simply or even primarily as a harbor from spiritual tempests. Rather, it constituted in a very real sense a refuge from violence, not, exclu not exclusively for the saints, but for every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor. As such, Zion would be a cosmopolitan community of peace. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. Zion would be protected from its enemies, not by force of arms, but rather through God's miraculous power. The glory of the Lord shall be there and the terror of the Lord, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it. They will say, let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. When the Lord counseled the saints on how they would obtain the land of Zion, they were given two options, by purchase or by blood. However, as the revelation noted, there were two problems with the latter violent path, one principled and one pragmatic. First, the revelation stated unequivocally that God's people were forbidden to shed blood. Second, if they did so, it would unleash counterviolence from those they attacked. While perhaps temporarily effective, the saints' resort to violence would ultimately undermine their very aims. The message of the early revelations was plain. Both the shedding of blood and the wars upon the face of the earth lay in Satan's realm, and violence was, was neither an efficacious nor a righteous means of advancing the cause of Zion. The violent persecution of the saints in Jackson County in 1833 and the resultant expulsion from Zion prompted a series of responses that changed their attitudes toward the use of violence. Specifically, the saints took upon themselves the burden of self-defense. This was most visibly on display in the so-called Mormon War of 1838 and the subsequent formation of the Nauvoo Legion. But the martial organization among the Mormons began earlier with the formation of Zion's camp, which has often been remembered and originally understood by many of its participants to be a divinely ordered military campaign to avenge the wrongful loss of land in Zion. This interpretation, however, runs counter to the actual language of the revelations. The February 1834 revelation that precipitated the, form the formation of Zion's camp declared that the redemption of Zion must needs come by power but it never asserted that this redemption would be through the instrumentality of human force or violence. Indeed, the only loss of life appearing in the revelation was the saints' own self-sacrifice. It makes no mention of God's people taking others' lives, even in self-defense or for the sake of Zion. Victory and glory would be achieved not by force of arms, but rather through your diligence, faithfulness, and prayers of faith. The Lord reiterated the point to the camp, contra the inclinations of the militants within the group, in a June 1834 revelation received while they were stalled on the banks of Fishing River, still well outside Jackson County. For behold, I do not require at their hands to fight the battles of Zion. For as I said in a former commandment, even so will I fulfill. I will fight your battles. The precise meaning of this promise that God would fight Zion's battles was not elucidated, though similar language also appeared in Smith's revelation regarding the ancient prophet Enoch's city of Zion. In both cases, the burden of battle was assumed by the Lord, who would preserve the righteous saints from directly engaging in war. Quite simply, early Mormon revelations never called upon the saints to commit violence, nor gave them license to do so of their own accord. Although in 18, uh, an August 1833 revelation did leave room for direct self-defense, the clearly stated preference, even in the face of repeated hostilities and innocent suffering, was always for a vigorous Christian ethic of forgiveness and reconciliation, with even death preferable to committing offense. Smith's early revelations unambiguously applied the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, long interpreted by the majority of Christian theologians as merely an individual ethic, to the social political realm. The armies of Israel, no matter how large or terrible, 
would occupy Zion legally and peacefully, and only after they had learned to sue for peace, not only to the people that have smitten you, but also to all people. Rather than invoking an Old Testament ethic of redemptive or retributive violence, the saints were admonished to lift up an ensign of peace and make a proclamation of peace unto the ends of the earth and make proposals for peace unto those who have smitten you according to the voice of the Spirit which is in you. Theologically, the redemption of Zion that never was had more in common with Christ on Calvary than Joshua in Canaan. There are compelling historical reasons why the 19th century saints eventually adopted violence, first in the form of self-defense and eventually by joining the nation's military in the Spanish-American War. But that doesn't change the fact that Joseph Smith's early revelations told the saints precisely how they should react in the face of violent aggression. With an ensign of peace, a willingness to die, not kill, for the cause of Zion, and an absolute trust in God's power to fight their battles for them. A theology and ethic of peace did not completely disappear after Mormonism's accommodation to the nation state in the 1890s. We can cite a number of powerful instances across the 20th century. My co-author in a book project exploring these themes, David Pulsifer, recently wrote about a remarkable but little known period in Mormon history on the blog Juvenile Instructor. He wrote, the church officially endorsed and organized anti-war protests during the first decade of the 20th century. These centrally directed and locally produced affairs were held annually, usually on or around May 18th to commemorate the first Hague Conference and were no small productions. Meeting houses were draped in international peace colors, gold, purple, and white. Ward, choir sang, uh, ward choirs prepared and sang patriotic hymns and anti-war songs. Poems were specially composed and recited. Peace resolutions were adopted and signed. And ward leaders, male and female, disavowed war and called for international institutions for arbitration. We can also point to statements from the First Presidency during the Second World War, such as, the church is and must be against war. The church itself cannot wage war unless and until the Lord shall issue new commands. It cannot regard war as a righteous means of settling international disputes. This prophetic stance against war can't be read in isolation since the statement goes on to endorse military service for male members of the church under the logic of the 12th article of faith and its endorsement of subjection to civil authority. But it stands as a powerful condemnation of violence nevertheless. Perhaps the strongest recent prophetic statement offering an unqualified critique of the saint's acceptance of violence came from President Spencer W. Kimball in the midst of the nation's bicentennial celebrations in the summer of 1976. His voice of warning is worth quoting at some length. We are, on the whole, an idolatrous people, a condition most repugnant to the Lord. We are a warlike people, easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When enemies rise up, we commit vast resources to the fabrication of gods of stone and steel, ships, planes, missiles, fortifications, and depend on them for protection and deliverance. When threatened, we align ourselves against the enemy instead of aligning ourselves with the kingdom of God. We train a man in the art of war and call him a patriot, thus in the manner of Satan's counterfeit of true patriotism, perverting the Savior's teaching. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. What are we to fear when the Lord is with us? Can we not take the Lord at his word and exercise a particle of faith in him? Our assignment is positive, to forsake the things of the world as goals in themselves, to desist from idolatry and press forward in faith, to carry the gospel to our enemies, that they might no longer be our enemies. In more than three decades worth of primary, young men's, Sunday school, priesthood, seminary, and BYU religion classes, I don't think I've ever heard this prophetic statement quoted once. President Kimball's teachings on heavy petting, plenty of times. His teachings on rejecting the false god of militarism, never. People in Utah County will be reminded of this for the next month. There's a billboard going up on 8th North and Orem tomorrow morning that says, President Spencer W. Kimball said we are a warlike people. President Kimball applied his own teachings a few years later 
when the first presidency formally opposed the basing of the MX missile system in Utah and Nevada. Some people might see the MX missile issue as purely pragmatic. pragmatic. Even the statement itself has the ring of not in my backyard. But this is precisely the point. An ethic of peace is both principled and pragmatic, and always situated in the context of local conflicts. Modern theorists have invoked the term strategic nonviolent conflict to recognize the fact that people use nonviolent methods more or less strategically to achieve vital objectives in conflict. Nonviolence is a this worldly strategy that is a creative, empowering response to violence and injustice. Yet for many nonviolent activists, there is also an otherworldly dimension, a focus on the long narrative of Christ's redemption or a belief in a cosmic arc of justice, which gives context and meaning to the suffering that inevitably accompanies nonviolence. The lesson of the anti-Nephi Lehi's, the lesson of Helmut Hubner, the Mormon teenager who was executed for his opposition to Nazi Germany, the lesson of Martin Luther King, the lesson of the crucifixion of Christ, is that the serious follower of a Christian ethic of peace must be willing to pay the ultimate price, to die in the face of violence. Even then, as Mormon noted with the people of Ammon, the payoff is both principled and pragmatic, though the tangible positive results are not always immediately apparent. In acknowledging that sometimes nonviolence does in fact result in pain and suffering and death, and that it often loses, we must also reveal the double standard implicit in the claim that peace is ineffective. Violence, by definition, results in pain and suffering and death. And by, def by definition, at least half of the participants in violent conflict will lose. Even when temporarily effective in bringing about immediately desired ends, violence leave de leaves death and destruction in its wake and creates a cycle of resentment and counterviolence that only a courageous, peaceful intervention can stop. Anyone who claims that violence works is looking through a narrow moral lens that does not acknowledge the humanity of the victims. Both violence and nonviolence operate on hope and faith. We trust that the strategies we employ will bring about our desired ends. Violence, it turns out, is no more pragmatic than is nonviolence. With that said, a Mormon theology and ethic of peace recognizes that temporal, effective, temporal effectiveness is not the standard by which we judge Christian attitudes and behavior. If following Jesus was completely ineffectual and impractical, it would still be the right thing to do. The key to the obedience of God's people, writes John Howard Yoder, is not their effectiveness, but their patience. The triumph of the right, although it is assured, is sure because of the power of the resurrection, and not because of any calculation of causes and effects, nor because of the inherently greater strength of the good guys. The relationship between the obedience of God's people and the triumph of God's cause is not a relationship of cause and effect, but one of cross and resurrection. We haven't yet arrived at a Mormon theology and ethic of peace, though perhaps we can see a few steps forward on the path. I want to close by quoting Eugene England, who was one of the first to help us envision the way forward. He said, we are confronted in scripture and experience with a God who is completely without violence, precisely because he treats all humans as infinitely precious, as persons, ends in themselves. In this light, the nonviolent theology and ethic of Jesus once again becomes normative, and any departures, the aberration. Recovering and heeding that wisdom, I suggest, will go a long way toward establishing a Mormon theology and ethic of peace. Thank you. Boyd choose the people. Oh, I get to be first. Um, when I have read the Book of Mormon, I've thought that it was a remarkable anti-war document. Um, and I read it right about the time of 9-11, cover to cover for the first time. So it was a very powerful thing for me. 
Um, and I've also, of course, been absolutely moved by um, Jesus Christ's docu- uh, um, proclamations of peace. And um, yet it's interesting when he says, I come to bring the sword as well. Um, but the thing that bothers me time and time again is the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament, and how, like, he's just so punitive and thundering and warlike and even tells the Jews to go in and, like, not only kill all the men and the women and the children, but all the cattle, and I'm, I don't know the references and all that, but you know what I'm talking about. And I've come to believe over time that I kind of think the Old Testament, and excuse my hesitation because I know that I probably shouldn't say this in Sunday school, but this isn't Sunday school, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, is that the Old Testament is so much of a document of an ancient patriarchal nomadic culture that I think defined a god through the lens of their culture and justified what they wanted to do by saying that they were directed, divinely directed, to do it. Now, I don't know what that says for the divinity of the document. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, they say that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. So, I mean, what do I do with all that? Yeah. The Old Testament is tough. Uh, it's, it's a tough document. But actually, I think the, the strategy that, that you just uh, cited right there is, is an effective and helpful one. Look, I, I think we are, the, the fullest revelation of God came in the person of Jesus, not in the person of Joshua, not in the person of Saul, not in the person of Samson. And that's why we're Christians. And, and so we have to believe, even, if, even though we uh, hold on to the Old Testament as scripture, as, depict, as depicting the, the relationship of God and his people, uh, the, uh, the Old Testament isn't normative for people who see the fullest revelation of God in the person of Jesus. It's not normative in the fullest sense because Jesus came and gave us a new law, a new ethic, a new way of living. That said, we still have to grapple with the Old Testament because especially as Mormons, we talk about uh, Jesus being Jehovah, being the God of, of the Old Testament. And, and scholars have wrestled with this a lot. And uh, um, w- one strategy is precisely as you've said, that essentially the Old Testament, it's, uh, the, the writers of the Old Testament were doing something like wish fulfillment, that the, they put the voice of God to sanction their human activities. But another, and, 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 and so that's one uh, reading strategy, but another strategy is to say, God works with us where we're at. And, th- and that you can see the overall arc of the Old Testament as one of God leading his people out of violence. If, if you look at it, that the, the prophets who come, Isaiah and Amos and the other great preachers of social justice, they come and they reject the ethic of violence that their people had espoused earlier under the judges and under the kings and so forth. And they say that's not appropriate. That's not the proper worship of God. The proper worship of God is through social justice. And, and so you can see in the Old Testament itself a narrative arc that leads with God leading his people and, and, and teaching them and bringing them out of, out of violence, eventually preparing them and preparing the way for the coming of Christ. So there's different strategies that, that, that people have. I, I sort of like that, that strategy. And, and the scriptures are ultimately a story about human fallenness. And, and violence is the ultimate and most extreme example of, of that fallenness. Um, I just want to say that is the most radical, subversive Mormon talk I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying this. And I want to find out, please, please, please tell me that, I'm I'm glad you're publishing this in the Journal of Mormon History, but please tell me that you're also going to publish this for the people. I want this to be accessible to everybody. Yeah, thanks, Janet. Um, And uh, um, 
uh, just on the, on the publishing side, uh, David Pulsifer and I are working on a book together where we're, we're gonna do a book length project of this. Uh, and uh, um, so, so we hope to have this out in, in, in the next couple of years. And uh, ab absolutely, and we're thinking ways we, we want it to be uh, scholarly because we want it to be rigorous. We want it to, to, to uh, contribute to broader uh, conversations about religion, conflict, and, and violence. Uh, but we've also talked about ways to make it accessible uh, to, to people who, who, who read a Deseret book because that's ultimately, I mean, ultimately if we publish with the university press and it gets reviewed in a few journals, woohoo for us. But, but, but that's, that's not really what, what this project is about. Um, and and so, so we hope to strategize to find ways to do exactly what you're, what you're talking about, to help people um, maybe read the gospel in a new way, or actually a very old way, uh, uh, but, but, but seeing the old in light of the new. So thanks, Jack. I'm just wondering if you'd seen Michael Quinn's recent article on uh, the culture of violence in early Mormonism, and if you had any response to that. Yeah, I have, and, and, and uh, uh, Mike has, has done a lot of terrific research on, on that, and, and in some ways we, we build on, on some of the historical research he's done. And uh, he's right, I mean, if, if you look at early Mormonism, there's, there's a lot of violence, and, and of course typically the narratives we tell is, are, are of violence against Mormons. And, and I think in, in the, if, if you add up, you know, the, the, the moral weight, the moral burden, there's more violence against Mormons than, than Mormons per perpetrate, but that doesn't excuse the violence that the Mormons do perpetrate, especially because their own revelations had told them. And in the first couple years of, of the existence of the church, they held to basically a pacifist ethic. And, and even some of the dissenters from the church, like John, John Carrill, say, uh, yeah, the Mormons were pacifist uh, before 1833. Uh, he didn't have a lot of nice things to say about the Mormons after he left, but, but he did say they were pacifists before 1833. And, um, and I think there's a lot of complex reasons why Mormons, Mormons are humans, for one. I mean, that's, that's actually not a very complicated reason. And, and they, they feel embattled. They feel besieged. They, uh, the, the, these are human responses. This is the early 19th century. This is the frontier. There's a lot of cultural reasons for their violence. Uh, and, of course, it, it culminates... Uh, in Mountain Meadows, which is the, the ugliest uh, stain uh, on, in, in this accord on, on Mormon history. And, and I, I really fall in line with, with a lot of the conclusions of, of, of the authors of Ron Walker and Rick Turley and, and uh, Glenn Leonard in, in their new book on Mountain Meadows. It's, it's, a, it's a product of culture, it's a product of fear, it's people responding to their environment uh, the same way that humans have always responded to their environments, and that's with violence. And, and it's these, um, that's what's tragic. That, that's what's tragic about it. So. so how do you see Ezra Taft Benson and David O. McKay's and other apostles, their response in the Cold War to communism because they weren't advocating nuclear war or okay. foot soldiers or anything, but entire conference talks about how we needed to fight communism tooth and nail. In the yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think... Um, and, and neither of them were, were pacifists. Uh, um, McKay uh, uh, was fine with sending troops in World War II. Both, both of them, of course, and, and the majority of people uh, condoned uh, and, and accepted World War II as a just war uh, and, and anti-communism as a struggle for freedom. Uh, Nonviolence uh, and, and an ethic of peace doesn't just roll over and play dead. And, and it speaks truth to power. It speaks truth to evil. And, and communism, the repression of liberty, the repression of freedom, the repression of religion, th those things are, are wrong. So, so nonviolence speaks out against those things. A nonviolent ethic, a Christian ethic, speaks out against those things. I mean, Pope John Paul II uh, spoke powerfully against that in, in Poland uh, from a Christian perspective. And, and so uh, Christian nonviolence needn't just shrug their shoulders at, at evil, quite the opposite. They should, it should be the first one to identify evil and repression and structural violence and to say that's not consonant with the kingdom of God. And, and we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna generate creative nonviolent responses to it uh, which, which help, uh, uh, which are consonant with, with the ethic of the kingdom of God. So we're not gonna resort to violence, but, but neither are we gonna ignore evil. That, that's one of the common claims of nonviolence or pacifism. It, it just wilts in the face of, of evil uh, and nothing could be further, certainly Jesus didn't. And, uh, and, and that's, the, that's the ethic that we follow. Uh, I'm curious to know if you'll be addressing the contemporary attitudes of, of Mormons about violence, uh, especially 
uh, in terms of just support of war or support of the recent wars we've been engaged in, and especially how it's voiced through Mitt Romney, who is, you know, it's hard to say whether he is the most violent in his language compared to Gingrich and Santorum, not just in his language, but in also advocating violence against Iran and how to conduct the wars in <laughs> Afghanistan. Um, and if that really is indicative of widespread Mormon attitudes, or are they an aberration? There seems to be a disconnect between that and what we have supposedly learned from our scriptures. Yeah. Well, I don't think we've learned it from our scriptures. That's the problem. And, and uh, I think we've read the scriptures the same way that Christians have read the scriptures for ever since Augustine. And uh, absolutely, uh, I want to consider our, our contemporary uh, commitments to, to militarism. I think we've been wrapped up in uh, the ideology, uh, President Kimball would say idolatry, of, of the nation state, that we run for our protection to the nation, to the Department of Defense, to the Pentagon, rather than looking to God. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to single out Mitt Romney uh, uh, because, because it's, a, it's a broader issue than that, as, as you've indicated. I mean, the vast Mormons were among the, the highest percentage of people who supported the war in Iraq and, and other things like that. And so, so um, I, don't, I, want, I don't want to speak by way of condemnation. I, I just want to speak by way of, of saying, uh, here, here's another way. And I think Jesus offers us another way. President Kimball, uh, how, do, how do you square your views with President Kimball, right? And, and, and bring back some of these texts. It, it requires a kind of uncovering, a kind of archaeological work to uncover these statements that have been there all along, but we've forgotten. And, uh, but these are, yeah, these aren't just historical issues. You know, we're, we're, we're not doing just this just to do a, a 19th century Mormon history. This, this is all about the 21st century. This is how we move forward. This is about how we approach Zion. Um, my question is about uh, the millennium. Now, the purpose of the church, uh, one of the purposes is to be able to establish the kingdom of God in order to receive Jesus Christ at his second coming, and then uh, there's a millennium. And I know that Joseph Smith set up uh, the Council of Fifty, which was like an interfaith, inter-whatever organization, in order to be able to uh, kind of bring consensus together and to be able to govern that way. I'm wondering if in your research that you found any specific links to future ideas of perhaps a Mormon government or a Christian government over the world and how justice and violence and uh, peace might be associated with that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think there's, there's different uh, strands of that within Mormon thinking. Uh, certainly you can find statements uh, with, with the idea that somehow Mormons will, uh, w will become the government, uh, 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 at least in the United States, if, if, if not more broadly. I, I think those, that position is, is large, um, largely a minority uh, position to the idea that the, the saints will always be the, in the minority uh, and may even be persecuted in, in the last days until the coming of Christ, and that's what will bring the advent of, of the millennial kingdom. Uh, so uh, you, you can find both strains, both you know what scholars would ca call a premillennialist and postmillennialist uh, strain within 19th century Mormonism. I think the weight of the evidence is on kind of a more premillennialist sense that the, the saints will remain in the minority, and, and then Christ's kingdom will come and, and initiate a, a kingdom of, of, of peace. Uh, and and, and that, that's fully consonant with, with what I'm arguing because the saints can establish uh, a Zion amongst themselves. They don't have to wait for the whole rest of the world, right? And, and that's the idea of being a light to the nations. Uh, and and to, uh, certainly that's what happened for early Christians. In the first 300 years of, of Christianity, they followed a radically pacifist ethos. A lot of Christians were, uh, were killed precisely because they wouldn't fight in the military. Uh, they refused to because they said, they said, we worship Jesus, not Caesar. And, uh, and, and so you don't have to take over the government to, uh, to, have a, 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 uh, um, to, to offer a strong nonviolent ethic. So how, how does this ethic of peace inform an approach when we are neither the aggressors nor the victims, uh, s such as Syria, w without it just being sounding brass? Uh, we, we could... Yeah stand up and say we you know don't like war and we don't like what's going on in Syria that doesn't seem to be enough uh, how do we especially 
when it's not ourselves or our, our nation right. that's involved. No, you're right. I, I think that is actually the, um, I think that's the toughest and thorniest area to work through with, with this kind of ethic and, and theology is, is not just, obviously you're not going to be the aggressor and you're not even going to rely on, on violence for self-defense, but what about defense of the other because love of neighbor, right? Uh, and, and that's partly where Augustine went is he says that we're compelled because of our love of neighbor to, to protect our neighbor. Uh, against to protect our inno the innocence uh, against attacks, and he even went so far as to say we're we're protecting by by restra by restraining the the violent aggressor even with force even with lethal force we're protecting them against themselves. I think that might be going a little too far, but but certainly the question of what do you do with, about the innocence, and I th th this this is a tough one and and a radical nonviolent ethic says first of all you will have done everything in your power prior to the instance of violence to create a culture and to create structures in, that, in which that violence wouldn't have arisen, right? And so nonviolence isn't just a reactionary thing, it's, it's proactive, and that's what I didn't talk about tonight is positive peace, creating structures and cultures of peace in which violence doesn't arise, you know, eliminating the roots of the raspberry bush, not just the shoots as, as they come up. But there's still a, a recognition that there's evil in the world and the people will be attacked, the people will use violence against yourself or against innocence, and a radical nonviolent ethic simply has to take the long view, uh, sort of like the anti-Nephi Lehi's, so, sort of like uh, Alma and, and, and was it uh, uh, Amulek or which of his companions to watch the people die, you know, burned, and, and say that, like Martin Luther King says, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And sometimes that's the only answer. Um, and it's a tough answer. It's, it's a really tough answer. Um, it's an unsatisfactory answer, but, but it may be the only one we have, uh, taking the long view. Because otherwise we're just perpetuating violence. Yes, I'm just one, wondering if you're aware of many Mormon conscientious, conscientious objectors during the Vietnam War. Um, in my father's papers, there was a letter that he wrote in support of a conscientious objector. So I wondered if the church had any policy or if it was just left up to local leaders as to whether they would support someone who was, and if, the, if you're aware of very many of it. There were conscientious objectors, LDS conscientious objectors, Vietnam. There were very few. They were uh, largely discouraged by the church. The church made clear that you couldn't make Mormonism a condition for your conscientious objection. You couldn't say that you're a CEO because you're Mormon. You had to state it on other grounds. Um, and, uh, uh, and in some cases there was uh, outright pressure from, uh, and statements from leaders of the church against conscientious objectors, but there were Mormons who, who did. I, I don't know what the numbers are. Uh, other scholars have looked at this more carefully and, and, and maybe have numbers, um, but, it, but it, did, it did happen. There are Mormon conscientious objectors now, um, and uh, I, I think it's clear that you could could make a very persuasive case from within Mormonism to be a conscientious ob objector. But, th but as far as I know, still the church policy is you can't simply say, I'm Mormon, therefore I am a CEO, the same way you might uh, as a Jehovah's Witness or, or, or a Mennonite or, or something like that. But I think you can still, you, you can obviously get there through Mormonism and, and people have. <laughs> 